program, congressional briefing. We're so pleased that you're all here. And I wanted to make a few opening remarks. Uh, CCI's mission is to raise awareness and to re remove policy barriers for children in foster care and children around the world who are in need of loving families. So we're so excited um, to be able to introduce you to the 2016 Foster Youth Internship Class. And the Foster Youth Internship Program, specifically in, in, in all of our programs, we try to make sure that we have expertise and experience and that we bring those voices to the Hall of Congress. So um, the Foster Youth Internship Program is no different. And we consider these 12 young people that you see before you um, experts on foster care. They've lived it and they have um, life experience. And they also have been refining their state and their federal advocacy and educational um, opportunities to be able to speak um, up on behalf of children who are currently in foster care, as well as alumni. So we're so um, excited about the briefing today and uh, wanted to make sure that you all knew that this program was actually established in 2003. And we have 180 alumni of the Boston Internship Program. These 12 will be joining their ranks at the end of the summer. And the program itself is actually not just a briefing, but it's a 10 week program. So they've been very busy working on Capitol Hill as well as researching and writing these federal policy reports that they're going to present to you today. So we're so excited for them to be able to share them with you and they've been working very hard all summer long. I also wanted to mention that you'll note on your cover of your report, that this is the first year we're debuting the Foster Youth Internship Program logo. And so you all are the first class to have your report um, include that. And it is symbolic, but the dome is symbolic of obviously where they're placed and who they're speaking to here on Capitol Hill. But the 12 stars represent the 12 interns, and that's what they are, very bright stars. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to just briefly acknowledge that we have a few of our uh, volunteer board of directors as, as well as our advisory council members in the room. I actually just saw another one. So I want to acknowledge them briefly. We have Susan Hirschman, uh, Susan Neely, both are uh, Ross Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> On our advisory council, uh, we have Sarah Gazarek in the room right here. And McQueen Layton, I saw Sarah yet, but I believe she'll be here. And then I saw Jerry Newton over here as well. So thank you all for your support. We couldn't do this work without our board of directors and our advisory council. There's probably a few more that's not going to be in. We want to make sure we acknowledge them as well. Um, with that, I'd actually like to turn it over to one of our board of directors. Uh, Susan Hirschman is the CEO of Williams and Jensen. She served in that role since 2015, and before that, served as a principal in the firm since 2002. And before that, she's worked in the house leadership. And so we're so excited that she's here and she's going to make a few remarks um, acknowledging the members of Congress and congressional offices that are very actively supportive of the program. So Thank you so much. And I first would like to just say what a pleasure it is to serve on the board of CCAI. We all do um, so many activities in Washington work and you know, maybe just squeeze in a few things um, outside of work and family. But this board is absolutely unique. I've always been a big supporter of adoption. I work on the Hill of the Court of Adoption Policy. Um, but 10 years ago, next month, when um, Abraham Hirschman was born, um, adoption became uh, even more of a personal issue to me and um, took on uh, a, an even more special um, place in my heart. And, you know, I have to tell you all, when my husband and I adopted our daughter, um, the response that we got from all of our friends was, oh my goodness, she's so lucky to, to be placed in, in your home, and she's so lucky to be part of your family. And David and I, my husband and I, were just sort of stunned because um, that's not what our heart was telling us. Our heart was telling us that we were so lucky to have her in our family. And, and, our family. and I um, and I am sure that um, that is um, something that uh, all adoptive parents feel um, in their hearts. So um, it is a pleasure to, to work with the board, and we are especially proud um, that in today's sort of political world and environment, where there's so few um, bipartisan efforts 
that um, our board, our efforts are very intentionally bipartisan and adoption is an issue that all sides can come together on um, and come to consensus and agreement on. And so we're very, very proud of that. Um, and I have to say, I've met some of you all and you were so impressive. I mean, the presentations that you've done for our board, um, you know, some of the board members remarked that, man, when we were your age, we wish we had the voice that you have. And so we are so impressed with you already. We're so impressed with the program. We can't wait to hear about the research and recommendations that you give today. Um, as a former Hill staffer, um, so much of the time, we were writing policy and making decisions on issues that we didn't have a real world experience with. Um, our staffers that didn't have a real world experience with, we relied on people to come in and explain to us what the policy implications were. But this program is extremely unique in that not only do you know the policy from a first-hand life perspective, but you're actually writing policy recommendations on a policy that you know so well. Um, and I think that is so important. So um, we are so pleased that you're able to participate in today's briefing. Um, and we really would like to take the opportunity to thank some of the congressional champions of the Foster Youth Internship Program. Um, we could not start the program without thanking um, our co-chairs, Senator Roy Blunt from Missouri, uh, Senator Amy, Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota, um, Representative Trent Franks um, from Arizona, and we'd also like to thank um, our outgoing uh, adoption caucus chair, um, Representative Karen Bass, and acknowledge her service as co-chairman since coming, coming to Congress six years ago. I am also um, pleased that we announced an announcement. I'm not going to jump the gun and make that announcement, but sit tight. Um, you will get to hear who the newest House Democratic co-chair of the Congressional Coalition on Adoption is, momentarily, so um, it won't be too long for you to hear that announcement. Um, and also want to thank the leadership of the Foster Care Caucuses in the House and the Senate for their support of the interns um, in this program, which is so important. So the, um, just as a reminder, the offices and committees that hosted the Foster Youth Interns in 2016 are Senator John Corman, um, from Jordan Fifth, Texas, um, U.S. Senate Committee on Finance Chairman um, Orrin Hatch from Utah, um, Finance Committee Minority um, Chair, uh, Chair is um, Ron Wyden, Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon, Senator Kristen Gillibrand, Senator Chris Murphy um, of Connecticut, Senator Bill Nelson of Florida. And then in the House, um, Chairman of the House Republican Conference, uh, Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers of Washington, um, House Majority Whip, Representative Steve Scalise of Louisiana, um, U.S. Committee um, on Ways and Means Chairman Kevin Brady of Texas, Representative Karen Bass of California, Representative Brenda Lewis of Michigan, and um, Former Chairman, Always and Means, um, Representative uh, Charles Rang uh, Charlie Rangel of New York. So, um, obviously, this program wouldn't happen without you, but also without them really valuing this program. So, thank you so much to um, all of the offices and committees that hosted the program this year. So, thank you all.
thank you guys all for being here. Out of the 12 foster youth interns here, many of us have heard the statement, well, you we do not look a foster child. This statement is embodied by stereotypes that the pastor labels upon foster youth for generations. Stereotype threat refers to being at risk of confirming a negative stereotype placed upon group. Today, over 300 experiments on stereotype threat have been published proving that when groups are negatively stereotyped, they underachieve on tasks they are expected to fail at. Fortunately, we have all been blessed with opportunities allowing us to be here in front of you today with aspirations to eliminate the negative labels placed on foster youth. But the stereotypes and negative labels continue to be on foster youth are hindering their ability to pursue and achieve their best. It may continue to. As a society, if we keep our minds within the constraints of stereotypes, we are wasting the potential of children who can be future doctors, future lawyers, future world changers. The 12 of us are not here on behalf of the so-called successful foster youth. We are here to represent what all foster youth can and ought to be when people look at them as more than what the statistics predict, while opening their minds and hearts to invest in foster youth's lives. It is an honor to be a part of and introduce the 12 foster youth interns Foster youth interns who have fought to have that future. They said I would be a drug addict living on the streets, but here I, am today, or here I am today trying to fix the system on the straight side. I was told that I would always be angry and go through multiple foster homes, but I was blessed with only one forever family. They said I was ordinary, yet I have achieved the extraordinary by beating the odds. Throughout my 15 years in care, I was in 16 foster homes, one group home, 
and two juvenile detention centers. The bouncing around from placement to placement taught me to expect impermanence. I spent my last high school year going to school during the day and working until late at night. After receiving my diploma, I had finally saved enough money to buy a car. I had a child in the foster care system at the age of 18, and I moved away to begin a new life of my own on my own. The issue that I experienced and that many foster youth experience is lack of stability while in foster care, even though there's never a definite amount of time the child is going to spend in the system. The Social Security Act states that the federal government has a responsibility to support foster parents. The government supports or can support foster parents with access to in-home placement preservation services. This should include conflict resolution and mediation services. Congress can incentivize the creation of a pilot program by identifying foster placements at risk of dissolving and provide these services. This will allow the opportunity for foster families to work together and understand problem-solving skills versus using removal as an answer to solve the problem. However, if placement changes must occur, children have a right to know when they are being moved. Congress could have great impact on improving stability in foster youth by establishing a 14 to 30 day notice of a placement change. This allows time for a child to adjust to new changes in their life and allows professionals time to identify and transition the child to a new appropriate home. The instability that I experienced diminished my desire of a family to call my own, and I do not want other foster children to experience the childhood of the fear and unknown that I had to. Lack of foster placement preservation damages the entire child welfare system. In home foster placement preservation services should be adopted to reduce the high number of placement changes that children in foster care endure. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Abby Marie Washington. I am a senior criminal justice student at San Houston State in Texas and an intern at Senator John Cornyn's office. In 2002, I was placed into a loving foster home with my older brother Dominic. However, several years after our arrival, he began associating with the wrong group of people and was removed from our home. Unlike myself, my brother moved through more than six juvenile detention placements in foster homes and became ineligible for foster care placements with other children. After being placed in so many placements, my brother decided to run away from his foster care placements three months before his 17th birthday for the third and final time. Except this time, there was no one searching for him because he was nearing the legal age in Texas for an adult, which is 17. The day my brother left, he wasn't the only one who lost something. I lost my brother, my friend, and my protector. Every day, I wish John Nick would have run through his foster care placements, and I wish someone could have been there to do more to help prevent him from running away. It's because of his story that I'm here speaking with y'all today. In 2015, over 4,500 foster youth were reported by HHS to have a current runaway status. Research suggests that family conflict is a key factor in why foster youth run away in addition to negative placement experiences, placement types, high number of placements, and entering foster care after the age of 13. The maltreatment of foster youth by caregivers also greatly impacts the foster youth's decision to run away. In 2015, 49 states identified more than 33,000 foster youth had experienced one or more forms of maltreatment by a foster parent, legal guardian, or in group homes. However, many cases of abuse and neglect in foster homes go unreported, and while foster home license may be denied, revoked, suspended, or restricted when a foster, youth foster parent has been named the offender and substantiated reports of abuse and neglect, foster home license requirements vary across states. In 2014, President Obama signed into law the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act, which amended the Social Security Act and addressed trafficking and runaway youth and child welfare system, re and reauthorized the Family Connection Grants and Adoption Incentive Program. As a result, states are now required to develop methods to locate missing children, like my brother, from the foster care system and to identify contributing factors to why they run away and address needs in foster care placements. It is my recommendation that Congress amend the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act to restrict the renewal of a foster home license when multiple foster youth in that same home have been displaced due to alleged safety concerns and maltreatment by a foster parent. It is important that we can ensure that all foster youth are living in safe placements and homes and find permanency. 
Thank you to Adrian from CRS, Jessica at the Children's Shelter in Texas, Marcia Hawkins, and Eric Maston at the National Network for Youth for guiding me in the report writing process, and for my brother for inspiring me to help other foster youth who have run away from the system. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'd also like to thank Congresswoman and Morris Rogers for giving me an incredible attention this summer. My name is Christopher Longquist. I was born in the People's State of Washington, and I'm currently a senior at Washington State University while I'll be graduating with a degree in psychology. Today, I am strong, assertive, confident, and I'm using my story to help others. I have CCI to think for that. But the man you see before you today was not the boy who went through foster care. People always reminisce, reminisce about their past as the good old days, but my life is a little different. I remember my mother teaching me how to dial 911 at parties, and I, being six years old, telling my mother to drink water because I thought she had the hiccups, when in fact she was afraid of overdosing. I remember being shipped off to my father's for being physically and psychologically abused every single day. I remember being in a meeting with child protective services, and none of my family members wanted to claim me and bring me into their home. When I turned 18, I could have and should have been a statistic. But by the grace of God, resilience, and the help of extended foster care, I am not. The approximately 26,000 youth who age out of foster care at age 18 each face significant challenges in meeting their needs for mental health, education, employment, housing, and emotional support. My older foster brother, who did not know about this extended foster care program, who wasn't informed, and as a result, he experienced homelessness, did not enroll in school. He fell through the cracks, and he became a statistic. My experience is why I am so thankful for this opportunity to stand here today to advocate for what made me succeed. That is why it is critical for Congress to point states in the direction that provide the best outcomes for foster youth who age out without permanent families and support. I recommend Congress should amend the Social Security Act to require states to provide extended foster care from the ages of 18 to 21 and to allow reentry into extended foster care up to the age of 21. Congress should also require states who receive Title IV reimbursements for extended foster care to educate all foster youth on their eligibility for extended foster care, as well as their eligibility for reentry until the state's maximum age requirement. This education should occur during the youth transition planning required by law for no later than six months prior to their 18th birthday. Not only do these recommendations increase success for older foster youth, but they're also helping communities and states. The negative outcomes that follow youth exiting care include increased welfare and Medicaid expenditures, higher cost of incarceration, and lost wages due to unplanned pregnancies. It is estimated that these poor outcomes cost the general population $8 billion for each annual cohort of youth leaving foster care. Look, the facts do not lie. There is data out there proving that foster youth that are enrolled in extended foster care excel in all areas. Less likely to be homeless, less likely to be incarcerated, reduced unplanned pregnancies, etc. There is a moral obligation that needs to be upheld and that is why it is so critical to help guide this vulnerable population through emerging adulthood by extending foster care and allowing reentry. With your help, we can transform foster care into success. Thank you very much. Greetings, everyone. My name is Lucrisa Bernier, and I would like to extend my appreciation to Senator Bill Nelson for giving me the opportunity to attend and turn in his office and create some invaluable professional experience for me. A child is like a precious little tree. It needs to be loved and nurtured to grow. But if that little tree comes to us already battered by rough winds, the road ahead can be challenging. My personal story, like most stories, may have had an unhappy beginning with a lack of stability and familiar support. When I was a junior in high school, I aged out of the foster care system at 18. I was forced to move from my foster home without any familiar support to find a new place independently. Since I had limited resources, I ended up renting a room in an unsecured place where I feared the eviction at any time. During this transition, I was afraid that I was going to be another statistic lost to the streets. However, through my faith in God, perseverance, and positive decision making, I was able to successfully break the familiar cycle of homelessness, disease, and substance abuse. Due to the positive encouragement of my educational advisors, I chose a different path for myself, one of personal and academic achievement, housing stability, and professional growth. 
Through my personal determination, I was able to graduate in four years with a double major and minor, despite the lack of consistent support. I was able to escape, excuse me, I was able to escape in much happier endeavors by entering graduate school to pursue my ultimate goal to become an entrepreneur. My goal was to have businesses which provide programmatic and financial assistance for foster youth. This assistance, unlike what I had, will allow them to reach their own fullest potential. Unfortunately, not many youth are able to reach their academic goals on their own. A child who experiences continuous placement disruptions can find it difficult to form attachments with others. My pilot program, Secure Attachment Training, will aim to foster meaningful connections between the caregiver and foster youth. This training may prevent the placement disruptions that lead to future poor social, intimate, and professional relationships. Building better connections between foster youth and their caregivers has the potential to positively impact future outcomes such as better academic performance, consistent employment, and college completion. This will also allow them to establish positive future relationships. I recommend that Country should create this program to encourage the development of secure attachment training curriculum by adapting existing evidence-based foster care training programs. As a part of this program, a team relational permanency assessment form will be distributed to help foster youth communicate their concerns about their current placement. Within the first 90 days of their placement, the assessment should be conducted by a child development expert and attachment training who will work jointly with the foster youth caregiver and case worker. To add, Congress should amend the Foster Care Independence Act to require foster parent training programs to include attachment curriculum. Amending the Foster Care Independence Act to include attachment training may help prevent placement disruptions, improve meaningful connections between the foster youth and their caregiver, and also promote future development of positive social, intimate, and professional relationships. Thank you. I'm Jason Moore, and I'd first like to thank everyone for being in the audience today. I'd like to thank the CCAI for this opportunity, and I'd like to thank the Office of Senator Hatch for this to so. Today, I'd like to discuss substance abuse in the context of child welfare. The recent opioid epidemics across the country have raised awareness about the need for effective strategies to combat substance abuse. Around 80% of the parents of children in foster care have issues with addiction. I was removed from my biological father's custody at the age of 11 due to his severe alcoholism but addiction to other drugs by other family members in the home is also present. My biological parents struggle to properly raise children and have mental health issues. It can be quite difficult to speculate on the cause and effect relationship between substance abuse, mental health issues, and the inability to be a properly parent. However, the stigma must give way to better understanding, and the state should emphasize rehabilitation for parents struggling with addiction. A recovery-focused approach should be utilized nationwide for these families. There are two phases, prevention and family drug court. The goal of the prevention phase is to keep the family together through offering services such as mental health, addiction, and proper parenting courses, once child and treatment comes an investigation by protective services. All three of these services can help the thousands of households across the United States who struggle with the same issues that my biological family did. It's preferable to address these issues while the child is still in the home because the removal process is an incredibly dramatic. The second phase is family drug court and would occur after the child is placed in the foster care. After removal, parents must comply with a reunification-based plan, which often means working with multiple agencies who don't always cooperate or communicate effectively, and this leads to duplicated efforts and administrative backlog. Family Drug Court is an integrated entity comprised of the court, child welfare agency, and the treatment providers, and has consistently yielded way better outcomes for families affected by substance abuse. I would encourage everyone to refer to the graphic on page 10 of my Congress should require states to establish family drug court standards as a prerequisite for the receipt of child welfare funding. This way, child welfare systems have the structure necessary to develop and implement and evaluate the programs. Important to note here is that criminal narcotics charges may not be dismissed despite successful family drug court completion. States should prioritize rehabilitation or punishment. Finally, community and faith based partnerships are essential because they provide vital components of recovery and continuous support to addiction afflicted families which would occur no additional cost to the state and would ease the burden on all agencies involved. A recovery focused approach has humanitarian, administrative, and fiscal benefits, and as such, Congress should consent by state season. Thank you for your time. I want to start off by thanking CCAI for allowing me to have a voice after feeling oppressed for many years of care, and everyone else who is here with open eyes and hearts willing to listen. I want to thank Congressman Scalise for welcoming me, 
In hosting you, office and staff make me feel comfortable and allow me to learn so much. And finally, I want to thank my wonderful father, Scott Whitman, who won't even look at me right now, because <laughs> he probably doesn't want to cry, who took me into his home and made me a part of his family after being my track coach and mentor throughout my last three years in foster care. He told me what I could be, when others only told me what I wouldn't be. You opened so many doors of confidence and opportunities for me, and I will not be where I am today without your relentless dedication and unconditional love in my life. In my first foster home, my younger sister and I were placed together. After I discovered she was being abused, I reported it to my caseworker. After my caseworker conducted, conducted an extremely biased and brief investigation, I was called a liar and told I was unplaceable. My sister and I were separated and I was placed in a behavioral group home for troubled teens. There were 10 children placed in this foster home and I believe my caseworker did not want to terminate the home because it would have been a struggle to replace so many children within the limited amount of foster homes available in our area. This left foster youth in a home where they were being abused. After being called a liar and told I was replaceable, I was scared to report, report the abuse happening in another home because I did not want to be placed in another callous institution or be pulled out of school. The morning my foster mother punished my younger foster brother for peeing the bed by forcing him to sit in the bathtub for hours while urinating on himself was the day I knew I could not be silent any longer. I reported the abuse to my caseworker that evening. Before the investigation, my caseworker and law enforcement notified the family of their arrival, arrival time. This allowed my foster parents time to threaten and brief the boy about what to say to the investigators beforehand. When the investigation was over, I was told once again that I was a liar and unplaceable. This was heartbreaking because I worked very hard to be an honor student, state champion runner, and to just be considered a good kid by the adults around me. When people are stereotyped or labeled, they often underachieve and resort to self handicapping strategies. When foster children are stereotyped, they limit their abilities. To help eliminate labels and increase stereotypes of foster children, Congress should create a National Awareness Day in the month of May, which is National Foster Care Awareness Month. This will encourage more Americans to become involved in a foster child's life by eliminating the negative labels society has preconceived about foster youth and allow foster youth to remember positive characteristics about themselves. In addition, to assure safety and well-being of foster children, I propose a policy recommendation which allows every foster child a best interest advocate. These advocates should be required to participate in investigations with caseworkers and law enforcement rather than conducting independent investigations. These advocates should also be required to meet with the child regularly in a confidential and private setting to reduce fear of reporting abuse or neglect in foster homes. With impartial advocates representing foster children, abusive and neglectful homes will be eliminated and more foster children will be cared by nurturing parents and healthy homes. second time in my life. I lived in a group home for three months and witnessed numerous youth with behavioral problems who often acted out of frustration, anger, or fear. As a result, many of these youth moved between the group home and juvenile hall detention. I too could have easily been in the juvenile justice system, as I saw running away and acting out as the only way to cope. I often think about my younger brother who is still in care and hope that he can avoid these negative life outcomes. Adolescence is a volatile phase of life, and involvement in foster care adds further complications. Foster youth encounter the juvenile justice system more often than non-foster youth peers. Youth involved in both foster care and the juvenile justice, justice systems are referred to as crossover youth or dual involved youth. Foster youth who are dual involved or have the potential to be should be quickly identified and provided access to critical services. Though the exact number of dual involved youth varies by region, data reveals that a substantial portion of incarcerated ju juvenile are foster youth. The process to track the number of dual involved youth varies state by state, making it difficult to identify youth in need of services. This lack of state reporting limits the ability in states to accurately compare the number of youth who enter foster care and become, in the ju and become involved in the juvenile justice system. Both the long-term costs of neg negative life outcomes for these youth and the associated costs to the federal government are extremely high. Studies show that dual-involved youth use cash assistance, 
supplementary nutrition assistance programs, Medicare, and homeless shelters at a higher rate than non-dual volume. The cost to maintain care for dual involved is more than approximately $65,000 a year compared to $47,000 a year for juvenile justice and foster youth. The Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Reauthorization Act identifies foster youth as high risk for involvement in the juvenile justice and encourages states to, um, to share records relating to abuse and neglected children. Yet it does not explicitly offer solutions for foster youth and in the juvenile justice system. There should be mandated collaboration between the child welfare and the juvenile justice systems. Congress should also establish a federal data gathering unit for dual involved youth in the Department of Justice and require each state on dual, to require excuse me each state to report data on dual involved youth to track in a new database. Congress should also set a min, minimum standard that state courts, juvenile delinquency agencies, child welfare <coughs> agencies must identify dual involved youth within the first 14 days of a juvenile delinquency charge and cross report. I hope Congress will ensure that states pay attention to these already extremely vulnerable foster youth who become entangled in the system and provide better services that can change the tra trajectory of their lives for the better. For the sake of my brother and for the foster youth I live with in the group home, I urge you to take action. Thank you. <coughs>
On May 4, 2010, at the age of 15, my six-month battle for my sister and myself for my mother's abuse finally ended. That night, I slept next to a stranger in a foster home, but was reassured by my grandmother and aunts that I would only be there for two days. Two days turned into months as we came to the hard realization that my grandmother could not be my caregiver because of a crime she had committed over 15 years prior. Despite her flawless completion of parole, outstanding citizenship in the ensuing years, financial stability, and demonstrated ability to provide a safe and permanent home for me, my grandmother's status as an ex-felon outweighed the benefits I would receive living with her. As a result, I lived in the foster home for over a year and a half, with so many other girls passing through that I eventually lost count of them, and was unable to create meaningful bonds with my peers and caregivers. Although my foster parents met the requirements to become licensed, I was subject to emotional and psychological damage from separation from my family and from living with strangers. Beyond reducing the trauma that may result from placement with strangers, kinship care placement enables you to live with known and trusted individuals, and is also more likely to help maintain ties to siblings, family, and community. Still, kinship care is vastly underutilized, and many youth miss out on its documented benefits. Many states have established stringent and arbitrary, arbitrary barrier, crime laws, barrier crime laws that are more restrictive than federal foster home licensing guidelines outlined in the Social Security Act. These laws immediately disqualify otherwise eligible kin, like my grandmother, from becoming caregivers because they lack an all-inclusive assessment of kinship applicants. Studies show that states with higher barrier crime laws have lower rates of kinship care. Many of these states ban kinship applicants for crimes that are minor, happen long ago, or have nothing to do with raising a child. Some states ban for minor drug possession, driving violations, defrauding predators, issuing bad checks, or even catching too many fish on a fishing license, something that clearly has nothing to do with one's ability to raise a child. States' inflexible barrier crime laws, which vary arbitrarily, have real and detrimental implications for kinship care placement. To elevate kinship care as an option in an overwhelmed child welfare system and to reduce the number of kin immediately disqualified from the licensure process due to a criminal record, Congress should amend the Social Security Act to first require states to adopt the criminal history record check standards of the National Model Family Foster Home Licensing Standards, standards which uses eight specific criteria to holistically assess kinship applicants. These criteria can be reviewed on page seven. Congress should also include a reporting mechanism to ensure accountability for effective and timely implementation of these model standards. I hope that you will all consider these changes so that we can begin to holistically assess kinship applicants and enable more youth to live with known and trusted individuals. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon and thank you for being here today. My name is David Nicholas Rivera and I'm a double major in communication and deaf studies for interpreting. This summer, I had the greatest pleasure of interning in Congress member Karen Bass's office. I entered the foster care system at birth and have spent nearly all of my 21 years in foster care. Unfortunately, an average foster youth who identifies as part of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning community will experience 6.35 placements before they achieve permanency. Double that of a straight. Personally, I experienced 18 different foster home placements. The instability started when I was outed at 14 by a peer for being gay. When the news reached my foster family, I was roughly told to leave. A series of unstable placements follow, followed as foster family after foster family asked for my removal. Because once discovered, they were not uncomfortable with my sexual orientation. I am grateful for my successes, but ultimately, the only thing that ever really mattered to me was finding a connection to a loving, stable, forever family. It is difficult enough for teenagers in the system to find stability, but for others like myself, stable placements are even harder to come by. In Allen County, one out of five of these foster youth are LGBTQ, but the overall number nationwide is unknown. When the state takes custody of any youth, it is their responsibility to be the best parent possible addressing the unique needs of the child, especially LGBTQ youth. But this is often not the priority. All parents, including foster and adoptive families, need support to be successful and stabilize their families.
Congress will require states to provide LGBTQ competency training and support for agencies of foster and adoptive families. The competency training and support should include one, education materials, two, mental health training to recognize depression and suicide risk is higher among this population, three, adequate terminology and usage, four, the do's and don'ts of raising an LGBTQ youth, and finally five, trauma-informed dialogue with agencies, social workers, caregivers, and the youth. A flaw in the foster care system is that the LGBTQ needs are different from their straight counterparts. But unfortunately, data on these foster youth is not collected nationally. Congress should require additional data elements to be collected about LGBTQ foster youth in the federal adoption and foster care analysis and reporting system, better known as AFCARS. Compiling detailed data on LGBTQ youth in foster care is a, cru is a critical step to determine their needs and how policymakers make evidence-based funding decisions. More accurate data will allow agencies, foster and adoptive families, and policymakers to better provide for the well-being of LGBTQ youth in foster care. Fortunately for me, when I was 17, I found the family I've always wanted, and in fact, this year my adoption will be finalized. I think back to not feeling wanted and it inspires me to ensure that other foster youth, other foster youth like myself, do not experience what I did with place of instability. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Princess Harmon. I would like to begin by thanking you all for coming today to hear our stories. We have felt your love and support and commitment and help of our wonderful CCAI staff and volunteers and the amazing offices that welcomed us for the summer. I would like to personally thank everyone in the office of Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence for making me feel at home and making my experience on Capitol Hill fun and educational. I would also like to thank my great aunt who ultimately became my foster mother. I witnessed the many sacrifices my great aunt made in order to provide for my two brothers and myself. She worked two jobs and completely changed her lifestyle to ensure we had what we needed. She went from having no kids to having to raise three children under the age of 10 and gave up her social life and a good portion of her check to ensure our family's financial stability. It's unfortunate to grow up hating casual days at school because you do not own any clothes that you picked out for yourself. School uniforms hide the fact that you cannot afford to buy popular clothes I remember being so envious of the kids who got to go on field trips to the roller skating rink or to Joe Dumars because my great aunt could not afford to send all three of us, so none of us were able to go. During my time in foster care, I heard so many people say that they were unable to foster a child because they did not have the financial resources. It was heartbreaking to hear adults commend my great aunt for taking care of my brothers and me and say that if they had the money, they would have done the same. My great aunt is not rich or well off, and she rarely received help from family members, but she sacrificed her wants and needs for hours to ensure we had as normal a childhood as possible. For example, I was able to develop more leadership skills, friendships, and an appreciation for nature through my experiences at summer camp. Unfortunately, not all foster children have caregivers who are able to make those financial sacrifices for them in order to achieve normalcy. This is why it's so important for foster parents to receive a reimbursement that is equal to the cost of caring for a foster child in a middle class family. Removing additional financial burdens on foster parents would better ensure each foster child's financial needs are met and will help ensure their feeling of normalcy in the child's life. Normalcy for children in care is vital to the development and successful transition to adult life. Thus, increasing state reimbursement rates to middle income levels would allow foster children to have a more normal childhood and better life outcomes. Too often, children are abandoned to congregate care facilities because of a shortage of foster homes. Congregate care placements are supposed to be for children with mental disabilities or behavioral problems and cost up to 10 times more than placing a child in a foster home. Congregate care should not be used as a substitute for foster homes. Children are more likely to find their permanent families through foster or in kinship care than from congregate care or group homes. Over 80% of adopted children found permanent homes with their foster parent or in kinship care. Thus, by increasing the foster care reimbursement, states will have another tool to help with foster parent recruitment and retention. 
This will lead to more available foster homes and a decrease in the number of children in congregate care. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Precious Price, and I would first like to thank you all for being here and sharing our stories. I would like to give a special thank you to CCAI for choosing me to experience this amazing opportunity, Captain Poonian, my policy advisor, and those who have assisted me throughout this process. I would also like to thank Senator Chris Murphy's office for entrusting me to intern with them this summer. It's been an amazing experience. So, a little bit about myself. I grew up in and out of foster care. I reunified with my mother about four times before entering care for the last time at 12 years old. With me came my older sister and my younger brother as well. Although we have our own stories to tell, I would like to share a little bit of my brother's experience with you all. My brother was always active, lively, and very good at sports. And over a two year period, he went from someone who was always energetic with a good joke to tell to someone who hardly even recognized me or responded when I spoke to him. During family visits, he would barely even look at me, but instead looked right through me like I was invisible with no emotion and no expression. This is what psychotropic medication did to my brother. And after experiencing this, I was so afraid of the physical side effects that I would not even stick to any form of recommended treatment. I use this form. Oh, sorry. I use this form to talk about my brother for two reasons. One is to present a picture on how real this issue is for me, and two is to inform you that although my brother's experience was horrible, it's not unique. Children in foster care are prescribed psychotropic medication at rates two to three higher than those in the general population. Some of the factors that contribute to this are insufficient state oversight and monitoring of psychotropic medication use and provider shortages. For instance, in just four short years, studies predict that although there will be a need for over 12,000 child and adolescent psychiatrists, only 8,000 will be made available to us. These professionals are best qualified to prescribe psychotropic medication to children in foster care, and it is imperative that the child welfare system utilizes these professionals effectively. This is why I recommend that Congress allocate funds to develop a pilot program to establish state-level child, uh, state-level foster care mental health centers. Through these agencies, child and adolescent psychologists, psychiatrists, would work with a team of other specialized individuals with knowledge on issues that specifically affect those in the foster care system. I also recommend that Congress include a provision into the Social Security Act to establish a maintenance matching rate for any state department or agency that employs a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist as a mental health director. Employing these professionals to oversee prescribing practices will improve oversight and create better protocols for appropriate use and monitoring of psychotropic medication. By establishing these measures, I strongly believe that the child welfare system will be able to increase accountability, thus regaining the credibility that is lost through experiences like mine and my brother's. Thank you again for your time and your effort. On behalf of all the foster care interns, foster youth interns, excuse me, we would like to take the opportunity to thank you all for sharing in our powerful stories. We would like to thank all of the congressional offices that have hosted us this summer. And last but not least, we would love to thank CCAI for giving us this amazing opportunity and for helping us to become our very best. Throughout this process for us, there have been laughs, tears, and, but most importantly, there has been newly found hope. Hope for ourselves and hope for children in the foster care system. I want to remind everyone that, yes, the 12 of us have had some experience with the foster care system, 
but we are not just former Washington. We are on our way to be doctors, lawyers, politicians, social workers, and other types of professionals. But we are also speakers, advocates, and now we are published authors, all with the help of CPAM. And we hope that you will continue to um, remember gaining experience from these inspiring individuals as you go on to transform the job of your system. And I'll leave you with a short but powerful quote that I think sums up the theme of this reading. Never judge a book by its cover. You'll miss an amazing story. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, my name is 
Lexi, I'm uh, an alum of the program. Uh, Jennifer just mentioned the Family First Act 2016, and I want to hear your guys' thoughts on the legislation, considering that there's just a few more days to vote on it, and I know that so many of you have talked to me about it and have uh, worked on it in your uh, congressional offices. I, I, I would like to answer this question. Um, the Family First Act uh, should be passed. And if anyone is from California, I would encourage you to reach out to your senators. Any other interns? Hi, um, David. I think it's actually a really good piece of legislation, but with any legislation, it can only it can only get improved. And I think that after it gets passed, it needs to be improved going forward. I'd also like to know, um, for the fact that there's only 21 states that have a student foster, I know I'm not my own policy member. Um, with this legislation, I believe it will open up the door to the other states to provide a student foster care. And so that's why I 100%, if you'd love to talk to me about it right after this morning recession, so approach me and I'd love to chat about it with you. Thank you. As far as that, I can really support it. Um, Jennifer did hit the part that you want to make sure that the funds are being in the right way. So that is one of the big things that I think we need to discuss just because we want them to be used the way that they should be as opposed to other things that they want them to be used. Does that make sense? <laughs> well, thank you for the excellent briefings. This is my first time to attend and I'm very um, very impressed by the caliber of all of you and what you've learned. Um, but I've also um, can surmise just from how you answered those last questions that you've learned a lot about how to be an advocate uh, to Congress and how um, laws are made. What's your takeaway about this place? What will you go back to your hometowns and tell people about the real Congress? Um, it's not as scary as I thought it was going to be. Uh, before I like, applied, I literally thought that like I wasn't good enough. I, I cannot like I'm not like worth you know Congress and um, CCA. I thank you so much because you proved me wrong, and um, I want every foster kid to know that you should apply for CCA to make a difference. And because everyone has their own story, and every story should be heard. Thank you. In reference to how we view Congress, um, when I'm back home, we definitely see that the Democrats are against the Republicans and the House and then there's the Senate, but then when we're actually here on the Hill, we get to see two sides come together and agree on a bipartisan bill that helps foster youth and adoption. That's beautiful. I'm from 
Michigan, from Detroit, Michigan, and I had the honor of working in the office of Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, and she's right over there. <laughs> Well represented in the room because she was staffed. Ron is over there too, and then I saw Lamia. I think she stepped out. I had to shout out on use. <laughs> but it is—it's a whole other world. That's one thing that I will take back, and um, that the uh, staffers, the uh, representatives, the senators—they're all people, and they all have emotions. They all have things that are going on in their lives and things that they care about. Um, and it's important to uh, touch on those things and kind of like. Let them know what it is that you care about. Get them to care about the things that you care about. Show them where you come from. Show them what you experienced so that they can feel what you, where you come from and what you experienced. Hello. Um, I have a question for Ben Cherie. Um, I really was inspired by your presentation. I wanted to know what, if any, racial implications this um, when we're talking about kinship and people being denied from kinship adoption. Thank you for your question. Um, that was actually something I thought about looking into for my research report, but just because of spacing and timing, I um, was not able to touch on it. I think that we can imply that because a large group of blacks, especially, and, and second to that, Hispanics, are largely and disproportionately represented in the foster care system, but also in the criminal justice system that just deducing from those two facts that you will have less kinship uh, kin who are available to care for these youth. And so that brings up another question of who are we putting in the criminal justice system and then who are we putting in the foster care system? And then who do we expect to be available to care for these youth who are looking for caregivers? Um, so like that was something I wanted to touch on, but it is very important and I think it's something that Congress should consider in the future. Thank you.
just had a sacrifice. Five years in care, so I will hopefully be an advocate for foster children so they can live their lives. So first of all, thank you to everyone from the Ways and Means office that is here supporting me today. I really appreciate that. Um, but being in the committee, like where it has um, so many subcommittees below, they uh, definitely informed me very well on uh, what each of the responsibilities are with these committees. And that's something I'm going to take back with me, but also hopefully come back here one day. Because um, everyone can be involved in government. I don't think that people see it that way. Um, but you have to be able to open your mind and understand motivations behind people, how to get um, the things that you want in action and why that benefits the whole population. Um, so thank, like, thank you for letting me be placed in the ways and means committee and being so um, accommodating to me. <laughs> um, and then also to answer the resilience question, um, the quote that I keep in mind and I did throughout all the years that I was in custody and all the other youth guys um, was in placements, group ones, whatever placements I was in, there was a lot. <laughs> but um, it's just be the person that you needed, even if that's just you. Um, because everyone needs someone, and that's not something that only a foster child can identify with. There's been a time where all of us have had a need that's not been met. And just remember that some of us don't have to need people, but just showing gratitude every day can get you really far in life. And you know, being that person to check on others and be like, how are you? And really being it. I'd like to enter the question if it's possible. Um, I really like to think that there is not one thing that allowed me to get where I am today. Um, so it's a conglomerate of things that were so intertwined, intertwined and all relied on each other. Um, I think it was a lot of hard work and I had morals of education still in me at a very young age, which was a very large factor, but I also had a lot of the right people coming in my life at the right time. Um, and I also think it was a lot of luck and good timing and a lot of these things all worked together to help me get where I am today. So I really tried not to say that it was, you know, sort of one thing that I can really pinpoint, but all these things worked together um, and helped me to achieve the success that I have today. I would agree with Nisha. Um, there's more than one thing that makes us who we are, but it's something that would stand out to me most and as cliche as it sounds, to not be a statistic. I watched my brother go from homelessness, struggle abuses, all types of things, and that's not what I want for myself. It's not what I want for my future. So seeing where he is now, he's older than me. I don't want to be where he is when I reach his age. So basically not being a statistic. That's a quick answer. Um, kind of like a two-parter. To answer your question, it's kind of like I don't know. Like when I was eight, I was living with my dad. It was horrible, but there was always something in the back of my head that I was just like, this isn't gonna last forever. You know, give it time. It'll, you know, you're not gonna live through that forever. For some reason, when I was eight years old, I thought that. Don't know, don't know how, and it still troubles me to this day. Um, the second part is lost. <laughs> um, yeah, lost. The first part was so good, though. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, for me, um, I think what got me through it was um, the determination, like the want to have a better life and to like not be where my uh, biological parents were. So just like having that want to see myself in the future, like um, it wasn't just a want, it was a need. It was like a need to get out of like the cycle of what my parents were starting. So I just decided to break away from that, decided to be my own person, and that's what eventually got me through it. I have three siblings in the foster, well, that one foster parents, um, as well as myself, and I think they were like the biggest force. But I think just having a seat at the table and getting to be able to have a powerful voice as our title, or important title, um, to use that for other foster youth that are going through many things that you know can diminish their future. So I think that has really driven me. Um, and people ask me all the time, and I'm not sure, but I think that's the biggest thing.
much bigger than me and people loves me and he has my back. So I know that's not cliche, but that's And I'd like to end. The answer to the resilience question is my Christian faith, but I am going to pull Jennifer and backtrack a little bit to Lexi's question. So I'm a big fan of the Family First Act, not least because it's from my senator, Orrin Hatch, but also because it actually, <laughs> it actually also prescribes the very recommendations that I made in my policy report, which are prevention services for mental health, addiction, and proper parenting cases. Now the, now the primary issue is it's being opposed in California by the LA County Board of Supervisors, and they, that, that county relies heavily on group homes. Now, I'm not from California, but you can talk with other people that were in group homes and see about the quality, but I know the ones in Florida weren't very great, and that's why we've actually decreased our lines upon them. So it cuts, it cuts funding for group homes, but as uh, Princess said, group homes are ther should be therapeutic in nation. You, you should try to put these children with their family members, which is why the Family First Act also allocates additional funding for kinship support which was beneath the issues. issue. So her recommendation of barrier crime laws would also need to be addressed in order for that policy to be, policy to be implemented as effectively as we'd like it. Um, so there's, a, there's an article, you know, I could, I, I'd love to discuss with you if anyone had questions about the Family First Act. And um, again, thank you for being here and asking us all these questions. Also, to mention that CCA Act does not endorse legislation. So, <laughs> 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 um, we wanted to just um, pause another point that we've had a special guest joining us for a little while listening to you all answer some of your questions. And we're really honored um, that Representative Brenda Lawrence from Michigan is here with us. And as you've heard at the beginning of the um, program today, for the briefing, we're very pleased um, to have a new House Democratic co-chair for the Congressional Coalition on Adoption. And Representative Lawrence, we did acknowledge Karen Bass and her wonderful service for many years in that role. And we are very much looking forward to your new leadership in that role, as are the other co-chairs. And so um, I'd love for you to come and make a few good remarks if you would. Thank you so much. I'm in awe of your future, of the great things that you're going to do. Often, uh, someone will ask for an autograph, and young people always say, do great things. Um, when you follow your passion and unleash the skills and talents that you have, you will change the world. And I, I heard from you, I felt you, and I respect each and every one of you. I am excited to step into this exciting new role as the co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Coalition on Adoption. One of my first things in being elected to Congress, and we're supposed to legislate, and my very first legislative accomplishment was passing an amendment that benefits the foster youth in HR 5. It reauthorized the ESEA, which is the Education Bill, also known as Every Student Succeeds Act. My amendment will require the U.S. Secretary of Education to track the educational process, progress of foster youth in America. Now, many of you may not know this and probably can't believe that we in America has never tracked the educational progress of foster children in our public educational system. And so I believe that foster care children deserve the same access to quality education as everyone else. But until you find good data so that you can address, are we doing a good job? Do we need to do better? And what areas can we support our foster youth in their educational process? So bipartisan, I'm a Democrat. The Democrats and Republicans supported this amendment and it was passed into law. So I'm very proud of my first step and my first act here in Congress. And so it's only appropriate that I get the invitation to put my passion into a caucus 
that is dedicated to the issues that are related to adoption in foster youth. I want you to know that um, I have had the opportunity these two years I've been in Congress to host um, a young intern, a summer intern, from this foster care institute in Princess, who we've had the opportunity to met an amazing young woman. I want to tell you my first intern, she was so passionate. She said, I survived. I made it through. And finally, I graduated from high school. And she said, I was behind the grade because I had some issues. She said, but once I graduated, I was homeless. Because I could not report to a college that I was accepted into. One that I had financial aid. So excited about my future. But the minute I graduated from high school, I was homeless until September. Kind of told me you need to fix that. She was very clear in what the challenges were. She said, I literally slept on sofas of friends and family who were kind enough to let me stay here. She said, but you know, I've endured a lot. And here I said, I survived, I made it, and I continue to suffer as a result of someone not understanding the challenges that I have as a youth. And so another thing that I was told and, and, and was very passionate about, do you know what we go through as foster children? And mental health is optional. Mental health is something I have to ask for. Because they'll say, do you need mental health? Do you need support? Half the children, she said, we're going to say no because we don't want you to judge us. We don't want you to know. And this foster intern told me, she said, do you know how often we hear our friends and colleagues who are in foster care talk about suicide? And she said, I was at the point, I wasn't thinking about it. I said, well, maybe I should. Everyone else is talking about it. She said, but I wanted to talk to someone. And it was optional. She said, Congresswoman, you need to make the requirements of mental health evaluations standard. Take us through it. Talk to us and provide that resource. Don't make it optional. So there, are, there is so much work for us to do that we really do care. And I, I have a personal interest. My husband, who is an amazing man, my husband for 43 years went to foster care. He and his brothers. And I married very young. So at the age of 18, I was married, had a husband. And all of a sudden, his two siblings who were in foster care, 12 and 13, ended up living with me. I became the parent of a 12 and 13 year old. And they were so happy respectful, and until this day, they thank me for saving their lives because they were able to be with family. So this is something that's important to me. I love through this. I grew up with a loving family, never had extended family, and the whole nine yards to be exposed to how important it is and, and what are some of the challenges and hearing their stories of how they mentally dealt with the, the issues that put them in foster care. So as I, I celebrate you all today, and I take on with full excitement and commitment to this issue, I want you to know that there are children and families all over this country that need us. And he, many of you here on the may know him from his former role as the staff director of the Senate Finance Committee. So. Uh, Russ served in the role of the um, Foster Youth Internship Program, uh, overseeing um, on a committee on, the, on our board of directors. And so we're very pleased to have him. He's going to make his remarks as well. Thanks, Russ. I am here because of Derek Riggins, Talitha James, Nicole Marchman, and several other foster youth interns who worked alongside me in the finance committee when I got to work there. I'm also here because I've been privileged to be a guardian for two uh, foster youth uh, who come uh, to live with me, take care of them in their older teenage years. 
and uh, that's why I'm here. We want to thank you for your efforts today, and I want to tell you about a movie that you've never heard about that some of the older folks out here in the audience have seen. And when you uh, have a little time after that through working you this summer, find the whatever app it is that lets you look at old movies and take a look at this one. It's called Mr. Holland's Opus, one of my favorite movies of my entire life about a high school band teacher who deployed various strategies with different students to help teach them how to play a musical instrument. And he found that one tactic didn't work, that it worked with one student, but it didn't work with others. And so he developed a whole panoply of ideas, of ways, both to help teach them music and how to use music in their life. Today we have heard a wide variety of creative ideas as ways to improve our foster care system, whether it be from training foster parents in different ways to better give care to their students, to notifying them when there's a change, to examining the licensure requirements of group homes, to all these different ideas. Most of your ideas won't help every foster youth, but all of them will help some foster youth. And when you watch that movie, I want you to pay attention at the end when all the students, many hundreds of the students that he taught over the years, come back to thank him for the wisdom that he imparted to them when they were students. He didn't really experience and see the result of his work until years later. I hope that you're going to see the result of your work in 2016 or 2017. And I saw some Ways and Means and Finance Committee staffers copiously writing notes today, so that may be the case. But even if it's not, if it's not for a decade before some of the ideas that you have proposed today are put into action, that's okay. I want you to know they will be enacted. They will have an impact. It may not be in here in Washington. Some of these people help influence the laws of various states as well. And so we're here today to thank you for all you've given us this afternoon. And I want you to join me in thanking some of the people who make our foster youth internship program possible. We have some people who broadly support CCAI, and they include the American Petroleum Institute and Jack Gerard, our chairman of the board, Chevron, the Dave Thomas Foundation, Luzerne Foundation, Willie and Corey Robertson, the Casey Family Programs, Equidus Group, and the Retail Orphan Institute. Are any of the representatives of those groups here today? Join me in thanking them for support specifically our foster youth internship program. These people either sponsor one of these students and cover their costs to be here, or they help support our program, programming for the students while they're here. This includes also Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, the Carnival Foundation, the Community Foundation of the National Capital Region here in Washington, Carrie and Scott Hasenbaugh, Laura Wheat and her husband Doug Wheat from Dallas, Texas, the Legacy Collective, and One Simple Wish, the Orphan Institute, and the Sarah Stark Fund for Foster Youth. So join me in thanking all of you.
you're in the room, um, or you may not be in the room, but I want to acknowledge that you um, spent extra time with the interns and really poured into them this summer. So we have Barbara Walter joining us. Thank you. 